some AP uh, papers from Always Seems Men, and uh, let me just, uh, just read part of this anyway. Um, at first glance, this is Courtney's, at first glance, Judge Irwin is the epitome of a morally upright government official. Throughout the story, our picture of the judge continues to develop in a positive light. The man is a gentleman without scandal, a second father to the son, to the son of his good friend, firm in his beliefs and unwavering. I thought that was a good summary of sort of the, a, a summary of the man's character, the character's um, character. Um, as Jack digs deeper into the judge's past, a different picture develops. This picture is the darker image of a desperate politician facing foreclosure, married for money, only to find the money gone. As the story develops, we begin to see that no man, at least no man in politics, is infallible, um, including in the seemingly moral Judge Irving. And I thought as a whole, most of you did a really good job of stating the meaning at the beginning. At least you're making an effort to do that. That's important. Let me just read one paragraph here. Um, the judge's attributes seem to be numerous and evidence of good moral character. Chapter 3, we learn that the judge is an Army veteran. Jack says of this fact, it, it, you know, I don't require uh, quotes. Maybe I, I, I probably will from now on because I think it, they, they, they contribute so much. Um, but sometimes you get the same quotes over and over. And I, I always appreciate quotes that no one else has used or that seem a little bit obscure. Um, you, you'd either have to have read the book or you know, found some other way to get it. But it, I think showing that you've read the book is always a good thing for you to do. Jax says of this fact that the judge is the only that I do not wish to be snotty about the judge. He was a brave man, even if he did have a medal to prove same. To prove same. He had proved it before he ever got the medal, and he was to prove it again. End of quote. Jack goes on to describe his childhood with the judge. After his father left, the judge shouldered the weight of the role of his friend his friend had abandoned. When the very child he loved, like his own, brings his enemy in, uh, into his house and threatens him, he holds his ground. He says, I didn't make any commitment except to my conscience. Willie bites back, threatening to destroy his career and reputation, but the judge won't budge. Um, and then uh, uh, this act of stubbornness almost leads readers and Jack himself to believe the judge is fearless because he has nothing to hide. Willie, on the other hand, takes the, um, takes the perspective with the phrase that we will see repeated throughout the book. Man is conceived in sin and born in corruption and passes away from the stink of the deity to the stink of the shroud. There's always something. And, and it, it's pretty pretty crude statement, but it just, it really does express the, really, a core meaning of the book, that all men are like that, and um, that would have been a good one, and most of you saw that, if you use the word meaning. As the truth of the judge's history began to fall into the light, everything we once deemed as moral takes a more sinister light. Jack begins the exploration into the judge's life with the all but pleading question, is there anything, Judge? Will I find anything? And there's more. Um, and I don't know if that captures what I saw in the paper as a whole, but um, and and uh, Mason's uh, style is a little different. Um, that's great. There's no, you know, his style. And I, I appreciate anybody that writes really directly. And as, as I would say, as I recall, he just gets right to the point. Which, not that. Courtney doesn't get to the point. She just states it in different ways, equally um, effective. Um, let me just read a paragraph. Uh, let me read his thesis. Um, this is the meaning of the book, The Corrupt Nature of Politics. Just simple as that. Um, this book makes it clear that it is not possible to play the game of politics cleanly. Any characters who aren't willing to deal under the table don't, um, don't last in the political scheme. This is most clearly seen in the most ambiguous character in the whole novel, Governor Willie Tallows. And you make that point several times, and that's a part of his you know, being direct, is restating something. Um, just simple as that. You can't be in politics and be successful and be completely honest. Now, whether you agree with that or not, that's not the point, and this book basically proves that. 
at least the book's perspective. Willie enters politics wanting to do things right. He was an idealist through and through. This is really what gives him his start in politics when Willie doesn't want to take a shortcut while building the fire school escape. Willie is uh, outdated on the matter by corrupt superiors. That's not what you said, it's something else, but trying to save money. However, when the fire escape crumbles and several students die, Willie is seen as a hero who foresaw and attempted to stop the tragedy. Somebody made the point that I'm not sure it would be completely true, is that he himself took advantage of the fire escape tragedy. Um, I think it was, and I tried to write it on your papers, it was mostly done for him. He didn't have to do that. Jack calls it his political luck. It, it, this, this did make his career, but he didn't have to look bad, you know, drawing attention to it. Um, with this image of an idealist, Willie begins to make a name for himself in the political sphere. However, the idealism comes crumbling down shortly after when he is put out up as a dummy candidate for governor of rival party intending to split Willie's party vote. Willie, not realizing he is being duped, campaigns hard. However, when his rival at the time, um, Tiny Duffy, tells him he's been played, and I think, um, um, what's her name? I can't even remember her name. Um, Sadie. I think it was as much Sadie, but anyway. Willie wakes up and realizes that it's impossible to win in politics by following the rules. The only way to get things done is to do anything and do everything necessary. Willie takes his newfound knowledge and bribes, blackmails, and intimidates his way to the government position. It's a strong thing to say, but I think it's really true in the book that he just can't win. He realizes that that explains it. He just can't win if you don't cheat. You know, if you don't cheat, you're not trying. That kind of attitude, I think, in politics. So he, he made that point really clearly. And then Marie... Um, let me see if I can kind of jump into it. Here's a thesis. Without accepting responsibility for actions of the past, one cannot move on to make their future. Notice there are three different, one is how man's basically bad, one is politics is corrupt, and here, dealing with the past. Not one, one is not better than the other. They're equally valid. And that's what I, the whole point I was trying to make earlier, that's why I like them, because they're all different, and, uh, and yet, you know, they, they promote insight into the book. And here's a, uh, just a paragraph from it. I just noticed there were several good insights here. This is near the end of the paper, I think. Um, Jack displays good tendencies when he takes, okay, he pointed out Jack's bad qualities and his good qualities. When he takes responsibility for things he did in the past. When Jack sees Sugar Boy, a, a, an example nobody else mentioned, and I'd forgotten, big book, how could you remember everything? When Jack sees Sugar Boy at the library and decides not to tell him who really killed Willie, he takes responsibility for the fact that if he did that, he would be just like Duffy. He would, be, he would remain one of the boss's men who did his dirty work. Just as he's about to tell Sugar Boy that Duffy was one who got Willie killed, he, he, saw, he saw Duffy's face and he... Uh, he winked right at him like a brother. When Jack realizes this, he decides not to tell Sugar Boy, and in doing so, takes responsibility for his past um, to the building himself of a new future. And you know, that was what I think all of you were trying to grapple with. How does Jack redeem himself? What's the evidence that he redeems himself? And that's an example I just completely forgot. I would have never been able to you know, grab it and use it. So I... Uh, that's really good. He, he Finally, he does something instead of sharing information, which he does throughout the book. His job is to share, even if it's bad, he's going to use it. Here's an example of one time he didn't do that. That definitely shows that he's changed. Jack builds on a new future for himself at the judge's estate. Although he doesn't get to live there with his true father, the judge, he takes care of another old man, and in doing so, makes up for his past actions. So he couldn't live there with his real father, but he takes his, whatever you want to call it, the other guy, and does for him what he couldn't do for his own father. He couldn't play that role. But I just thought, again, it was a good point showing uh, clearly, I think, that he had redeemed himself. So, And there were others you can see for yourself. You can look at your own paper and see some of the other things that were really strong and I appreciate that um, 
really the, the thing I wish we could do more, I do have to grade other papers, you know, I've still got ninth grade papers, right? I would love for us to write more. Um, I've got several, I've thought of them over the, over the break, several uh, examples of, um, of essays that I hope we get in, because I use them some years, some years I don't, but um, we got to write more about poetry, we got to write more about prose, and uh, we will do that. So congratulations, everybody made a good effort um, to do that. Uh, what I'd like you to do here, can somebody get Emily, I don't know where she is, she might be just right outside, but thank you. Oh, yes, Courtney. Yes. Would you get out the poem, uh, My Last Duchess? Uh, it's such a good one. It, it teaches us a lot of things. I'll ask us is... Anybody have a copy? I know we did the multiple choice. I gave you the answers. Um, I'd like to look at this fairly quickly. Um, I think I gave you questions with it. Don't you have questions with it? Yes. Yeah. Do, do you have questions that accompany this or not? Is there, okay, I need to find mine. Somebody to read it. It's been a long time. Uh, we're hearing it again. Any volunteers to read it? Uh, thank you, Henley. Um, remember, uh, the key thing I'd like to focus on is this is a dramatic monologue. And so you only get one person's point of view, and that is not this that is not the author's point of view, it's the speaker's point of view. Uh, so just keep that in mind. You don't hear anybody, so, you know, it's a one-sided story. You have to figure out if he's telling us the truth or not. Would be some stupid. 
read that well. It's hard to read um, because it has, I think we talked about this word, enjambment. It doesn't end at the line. It moves up. Do you need a copy? Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, it, it moves from line to line. You, you can get one. I got one right here. Can I ask about that? Yeah. It doesn't end at the end of the line. Would you get one that's important? All right, so here are the three things that uh, I would like for us to kind of focus on. Uh, this is, since it's a scene, it's a dramatic monologue, what, what is going on in the scene? Who's involved in the scene? What do you know about the, the, the speaker? And what do you know about the Duchess? Because that's who the poem is, is, is about. So can anybody explain what's the occasion, what's the setting? Uh, we, we know it's the Renaissance, but the question reveals that. But yeah, Liam. I believe he said that the speaker was like the Duchess's husband, um, and like the occasion for her to be visiting his house. Yes. And um, offered to like um, ask him to marry their daughter. Right. So what what can we say about the Duchess? Like, what's her status right now? She did. Probably. Um, and so that's that is the occasion, and they actually have more specifically. Where are they standing? We even get to know sort of they're in a house. Where in the house are they? Are they um, in re relation to the other people that are in the house? What are they looking at? Can anybody go that far to tell us those things? Yeah. They're like upstairs. Right. And because they talk about going down to the other group, right? And looking at art, and what particular piece of art are they looking at? Well, right now they're looking at a painting of his last wife. But you're right to, to suggest there are other things they look at as they go down, and it's probably not the only thing they look. Do you notice anything about the, the location and um, anything about the painting itself? And any, any detail that's kind of revealing about that? And I never, I never saw that. Remember, we pointed out that that's not a long time to spend on a, on a piece of art. I never thought of that. It was, it was that quiz that you took that revealed. I probably got that question wrong because I never thought about that. Isn't that, isn't that something? A little detail like that they ask you then. Yes. Um, Who's speaking there? Because that's another question. He's not, they're, they're just, they've got. The, the painter said that. That's right. And why is the painter saying those things about her? Well, if you were going to paint a picture of the Duke's daughter, and maybe the Duke is standing, <laughs> he's right there, you know. Um, why would you be so complimentary of the Duchess? Uh, not the daughter, but the wife. Why would you be so complimentary? You want to you want to keep your job. You're trying to make this guy happy. So uh, I'll talk about how beautiful your wife is. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just suspicious. But um, I think that I think that's an important line. It's, um, did you notice that the painting was behind a curtain? I don't know if that's typical, but um, what does that allow the Duke to do with the painting? Not look at it. And, and who else cannot look at it? Everybody else. Anybody. And who who's the person that controls the painting? The Duke. Is, is that in keeping with the character of the, the Duke that you've seen in this poem? How so? How so, Sarah? Well, he just, like, very controlling, and he's like talking about what he wants yeah. his next life. It, did anybody pick up, and the questions on the quiz might have helped you with this, um, to continue to support that further, 
What was the last artwork that he showed the guys that walked down the steps? Remember what? Yes. Why might that be significant? And a, a, a god, is, is a, 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 in, in addition to that, it, it's Neptune. And, uh, and so that, that's in keeping. That's kind of artwork this guy likes. Uh, he likes to dominate the situation. Uh, all right, so we know what's going on. We know where it's going on. We're getting a little insight into the, into the, uh, the Duke. Any other insight into the Duke that you think significant? Very controlling, that might be the most important thing. Anything else about him might be significant. Um, can I ask you how reliable is he? He's the only guy speaking in the in the except for he quoted the uh, Frost handoff, but um, I think he may have quoted her too. But how reliable can it is the the do? And that's something to consider in poetry and prose, like Huck Finn. How reliable is Huck Finn? It's the only guy who talks. Or, I would say the dude, I mean, I don't think he would be that reliable because he seems very self-serving. Mm-hmm. So I feel like he is going to say whatever he needs to, or whatever he thinks he needs to say to get what he wants. So, I mean, I also think a lot of stuff he says about the ex-wife doesn't seem, or the dead wife. Yeah. Do you see a contradiction between what what he inadvertently reveals about the ex-wife and what you just said, what he really what he thinks about her? In other words, is she as bad as he makes him makes her appear? We only know what he says, but without maybe meaning to, I mean the author means to, but without the Duke meaning to, what kind of person is she as bad as all that? He didn't like it, yeah. Like, well, the, the stuff he says in the negative, like the stuff he's upset about, is like for liking people too easily, yeah. and being too nice to people, which all seem like positive things. <laughs> exactly. We like that kind of person. I think most people reading it would like the Duchess. Um, and yet, it, it, these very things that we like about her, he doesn't like about her. Um, so that that shows being the reliability of the narrator. I think is significant and important. Um, and so we've seen about him, we've seen a little bit about her. Um, what do you think, the, and I don't want to you know, leave too much out, but we run out of time. What's the bigger issue here? What do you think the theme of, or the meaning of the, um, of the poem uh, is? Like, what's he trying to say other than just about his last duchess and that he's a jerk? And, um, He's, he's domineering and controlling, and she was a pretty nice girl, but he didn't like because he was, he was uh, maybe the guy was flirting with her, and he was flirting with the, the frog hand off, and he didn't like that. Yeah. Well, I think he killed her. <laughs> I can see that too. Hence the vibes. <laughs> and Tell me where he almost comes right out and says it, but where do you, you see that? Well, I just think. Well, he has a curtain over her. Like, he's not very a shroud. upset about it. Almost yet. like a shroud. He's like hiding her. And it, the whole time he's kind of like saying what he doesn't like as if it's almost a warning for his next one. Yeah. Like he's trying to justify yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the way he's talking about it. That's a good point. He doesn't really care. He's, he's, making a, he's making a case for this next one, you know, too. Um, yeah, anything else about him? He says it, yeah. I, I just I want to agree with Sarah. I don't think that he just laid out a wife that he didn't like to some sickness or whatever. I think that he would take action into his own hands, considering how controlling he is. I gave commands, then all smiles stopped altogether. There she stands, as if alive. What What's the double meaning of that, as if alive? She ain't alive no more. What? She ain't alive no more. Right. But what's the other meaning now? Well, I'm looking at that picture of the Lord of the Rings, and that guy looks like he's alive, doesn't he? I mean, it's so realistic. It looks like he, he could just let go of that arrow any time and just sail through the room. 
don't we talk that way about pictures and about photos? So he could be referring to the photograph, or the picture. It, it's so good, it's almost like she's alive. Uh -oh. Like she's alive, it certainly makes you think that she's not. She's looking down on me. Yeah, right. Um, so uh, what do you think? Is, it, is, she, is he trying to make any comment as far as life in general is concerned about human nature? I think to really make this point good, you, you probably have to go there. What's, what's the bigger meaning? How would you state that? It's a neat picture of a, a duke and his wife and a control vote. Beyond that, does it link to anything else? Is it broader than just one guy in one time? And no one's ever been like this. He's one of a kind. Well, I just, um, this is you know, not a very uh, deep comment or thought, but if it was written in a different time, I'd think that it was about Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Oh, goodness. I've seen the crown. Uh, I think we've had this conversation, haven't we? Um, <laughs> that could be on the front cover of Globe magazine or National Enquirer. So you're telling me that this isn't one of a kind. That he's a kind of he's a kind of a person that exists so. in life. There are people like him today. You know, it always I think that he's an all too common character. Yeah, I like a yeah, like a yeah, like a like a What did you say? Like an archetype, like archetype, yeah. So how would you describe how would you describe the archetype? What is the archetype that he represents? Well, I think he kind of represents me like the higher part of society, in a way, like like the royals, like Charles and Diana. We're not there. You're not there uh, historically. You haven't gotten there yet in, in your history. But this was written during the Victorian period. The British Empire controlled the world. The sun never set on the British Empire. And it seems to me that this is a character perfect for that time period. The Duke is England. You know, it represents a quality maybe in England and other, other empires of other of eras. But the idea of domination, world domination, this guy is perfect for that time period. Even though he lives in the Renaissance, that is the character, um, it's perfect for the Victorian era of domination and world conquest, and he's just like that. Um, well, you did a really good job. I made this, this, I wrote this down Monday when I was grading these papers. Let me just, uh, somehow I was able to link the goodly fear Remember that? We didn't spend a lot of time with it, but it was Ezra Pound's poem about Jesus. Remember that? Yeah. Goodly fear, my last dud, just the chimney sweeper and Huck Finn. And can I tell you how those things, four things go together before we leave? Each, and this is something to look for, each reveals the importance of the narrator. Think about it. The goodly fear is narrated by Simon the Zealot. So what does he see in Jesus? He sees a man, a man, you know, a man that they couldn't, they couldn't keep him down. He, he laughed at him from the cross. He said, you can't, you know, that's how the goodly fear, that's how Jesus is seen by the narrator, who himself is a manly man. Think about the chimney sweeper. Remember how the chimney sweeper is a, little, a young boy who says something that the, the, the speaker is, is satirizing? I mean, the poet is satirizing the speaker. In the words of the speaker, the speaker said, "You got to be a good, little boy. You know, you got to do your work and go to heaven." And the 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 writer is satirizing that attitude. Same thing with Huck Finn. As you read Huck Finn, Huck doesn't ever. We talked about that. Never says anything bad about slavery. But in in he makes these comments that reveal an attitude at the time that um, that allows Mark Twain to satirize slavery to show how bad it is. In my last duchess, again, he reveals things about himself that are not complimentary, that he doesn't intend to, but he's just being himself. And by talking too much, he actually keeps revealing something about him. So just note that when you look at poetry or even books, Jackson, for example, um, the narrator plays a huge role. The point of view plays a huge, huge role. 
uh, in the meaning of the story. And like I was trying to articulate at the beginning, every aspect of the work of art, poet, poem, or story, if it's a great work of art, every aspect is perfectly chosen. Huxton is perfectly chosen for the subject matter. The, La the Dutch or the Duke is perfectly chosen for the subject matter. And that's, uh, that's one reason it's so great. It all works together. So good job. Um, we'll see you tomorrow, right? And, and Friday is the day that it could snow. And that's the day we were, right? Is that when this is good? Yeah. Yeah. So you know what? I mean, I, I don't really know what the policy of this, but if I was going to give you a reading quiz Friday, I'd probably want to give it to you Monday, and I would look at the schedule to see if you have a huge test, but if you were going to be prepared for a Friday, just keep that in mind. Okay. That would give you an extra weekend to prepare for. Yeah. I'll see you tomorrow. I don't think that's the fun. Much. See you. It's good to be back. Yeah. Good. 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 Good.